Momentum is about movement. It's taking a step into godly purpose, investing ourselves into the kingdom, taking the momentary to eternity. It's something to be gained. It's a turning motion to shift, but always shifting forward. It's transforming. Our story is unfolding into a new yet familiar adventure. It's like holding a memento while recognizing the hand of the artist in all the new things in unlikely places. Saying what God's done before will happen again, but it won't look like what we're used to. It's a surprising plan only God could create. It feels like revival. It feels like anticipation. And it looks like His invitation. And we accept. So let us hang on with holy expectation and know that God is calling us to greater things. We just have to say yes. Hey, Sanctus, good morning. So glad that you are joining us once again or for the first time. Okay, welcome back to the book of Acts. Today we are entering into maybe in my humble opinion, probably one of the most, if not the most important passage for this cultural moment in the book of Acts that helps us in 2024, and actually I would say helps us in any generation. Uh, let me begin in a different place though. It's November 5th, 15th, uh, 1982. Uh, the Cold War is still raging. Some of you remember those days, lots of you don't. 41 years ago, something massive took place on that day. It was the funeral of Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union. And in that moment, at his funeral, there was an unbelievable act of courage that's been lost to history. It's actually summarized by another, uh, but it was lived through this person. At that moment, Vice uh, President George Bush, so that's George Bush Sr., for some of you who know him, represents the U.S. at this funeral. Bush, it's recorded, was deeply moved by a silent protest that was carried out by Brezhnev's widow. She stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before it was closed. Now remember, all the elite of Russia are here. This is live on television, this is recorded. All of the blood red crimson flags of communism surround the coffin. She's standing, she's standing there. Then just as the soldiers touched the lid of the coffin, his wife performed an act of great courage and hope, actually a gesture that must be surely ranked as one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached down and she made the sign of the cross over her dead husband's body. There, think about it in the citadel of the secular atheistic world, a wife of the man who ran that world was publicly declaring that she was hoping her husband was wrong. She's actually hoping that there was another life, that this life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross and maybe this same Jesus would have mercy on her husband who had just died. Interesting story, true story, inspiring, yes, but it brings up this question that's incredibly relevant for us. What does it mean for the cross, that is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, to be proclaimed publicly in a place of re resistance, apathy, and confusion? And like I just shared, we come, I would say, to one of the most important passages in the whole New Testament that helps us know as Christians how we're called to engage with a culture that is hostile and diverse. And again, if you're not a Christian or exploring, this will help you have that conversation where you're at. So let me take us all back to when Acts is being lived out. At this moment, it's hard for us to fathom, there is not a church building in the world. At this moment, the cross is not a symbol of hope that's won by hundreds of millions, billions. It's only torture. There is no written Bible as we know it today with the full Old and New Testament. There's no concept of human rights because that's a Christian invention in the Western experience. There's no en masse hospital movement. That's also an invention of the Christian movement in the West. All of this comes later. 
In this moment, though, in the book of Acts, we walk into the place of incredible influence where the Christian faith begins to fully engage with what the Roman world held so dear. And this all takes place in a place that lots of us love to travel to. Welcome, everyone, to Athens. Okay, by the time Paul reaches Athens, Athens has lost some of its grandeur. Rome is more important, of course, uh, Alexandria, other places. But it still stood as a great place of philosophical power. It still was unrivaled in sort of thinking and architecture. Now, Athens at this moment is a blend of spirituality. Uh, the worship of many Greco-Roman gods was still done. The vast majority of people still believed in Zeus and Hermes, and, and you can fill in all the blanks. It was also at the same time a center of enlightened philosophy. So to use our language in 2024, you've got a beautiful city full of gorgeous architecture and lots of history, and spiritually it's the New Age mixed with formal uh, worship of multiple different gods, and you've got in the mix also like a very passionate university department talking about philosophy. That is not the easiest place to share the good news about Jesus. And by the way, if you live in any major city on earth, we live here in Toronto, or you just go online for a while, you should feel right at home because that's actually how much of the world is. So Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy to rejoin him. And while he's waiting, he ends up in Athens, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and then something goes wrong for him. Now, we would all go, okay, Paul, you've been through so much, you've been tortured, you've been persecuted, you know, this is a great time to have a vacation, you know, just enjoy the hummus, take a gyro, you know, get some good olives, have some Greek wine, put on a toga, go to the museums, they're pretty epic, just breathe a little bit. But that's not what happens to Paul. As he's walking along, this is how his emotional reaction is recorded. In verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Now, Athens was filled with glorious temples, gorgeous, beautiful, architecturally stunning. The Parthenon, it's at its height. The thing we still go and visit today was totally intact. And there was thousands of smaller and larger temples and shrines. And they were beautiful and they were the center of culture and they reminded people of a thousand plus years of history. But Paul's reaction was not awe, but incredible deep distress. The, the word distress, by the way, in the original language has real power here. Something that causes severe emotional concern. Like this is really bothering him. He's not denying the beauty, but he sees beyond the beauty. He knows that beyond all the beauty is human, uh, human pride. Behind all the stunning architecture is the shadow of Babel. And actually behind all of that is the real embodied presence of the demonic. I mean, he summarized this best, didn't he, when he was writing Christians in Corinth when he said in 1 Corinthians 10, 19, do I mean that food sacrificed uh, to idols is anything or an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons and not God. I do not want you to participate with demons. Paul's heart is actually broken. He's deeply disturbed. And yet, what he does next in this moment shows us in 2024 how to engage in these deeply distressing moments. He shows restraint. He shows respect. He works incredibly hard to build bridges and find common ground. Not so there's some kumbaya moment. No, no. He does it because he wants to cross the bridge, find the common ground to tell people about Jesus. So he follows his classic pattern, which we've seen again and again. Verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with Jews and God-fearing Greeks. He starts with those, of course, that have most in common with him, the most bridge built, bridges built already. Remember, I keep saying this, Christianity is not a separate religion from the Jewish faith, Judaism. It's the Jewish faith fulfilled through Jesus. Why? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the King of the Jews. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's the Son of God. I mean, that's why Paul wrote, right, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It has the power of God for anyone who believes, first for Jews, then non-Jews. But interestingly, he then decides and he models that he won't stay in the shelter of the familiar. He refuses to be in some religious monastery or ghetto. He goes out trying to reach two groups of people, so different, so opposite, both lost in the exact same way, but can't stand each, it can't stand each other. So he records it like this. Yes, he's in the synagogues first, but then in verse 17, he says he's also in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. Now, this marketplace is called the Agora. This is not just some public park. This isn't a dog park. This is the main public place at the heart of Athens. 
In this one place, you sort of have the economic, political, and religious and culinary part of life all together. It's like, if you're Canadian, it's like you mix Bay Street with Ottawa with your local mall and Loblaws. Or if you're American, you go to Wall Street and Washington and Whole Foods uh, surrounded by a forest of idols. I mean, that's basically where he's at. The closest modern experience I have to at least the amount of idols is when I've been in India, where literally everywhere there are shrines and temples and statues. So day after day, he's street preaching, basically. He's in public, and, and he's in the place of great religious, but also philosophical and economic and culinary experience. In the middle of all this highbrow thinking, he encounters the greatest thinkers of the day in Athens. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to argue with him. Okay, let's slow down, and let's understand what a Stoic and Epicurean philosopher is. Number one, what's quite shocking is both of those philosophic camps rejected all the gods of Rome and Greece. They didn't buy into Zeus and, and Hermes. No, nope. They believed sort of in one god-ish. Epicureans were all about now. They were all about pleasure. They thought, you know, the absence of pain and the lack of disturbance is what you want in life. Uh, have fun in life. It doesn't really have an effect on the supernatural. God, whoever or whatever that is, set up the world, set up a bunch of laws and walked away. We would call them deists today. The idea God makes the universe like a grand clock. He winds up the clock and he's like, I'm out. So they're like, hey, listen, a little bit more sex, a little bit more drink, a little bit more fun. That's fine because that's actually what life is about. It's about pleasure. The Stoics were absolutely the opposite of the Epicureans. They believed also in a supreme God or a cosmic mind, but they were pantheists. They actually thought God was in everything and everywhere. The world was divine. So actually, you should deny yourself. Actually, life is about self-sufficiency, courage, and duty. It's not about pleasure. So both camps are a mix of something supernatural, sort of, something natural, sort of, something philosophical, sort of-ish. Well, both groups who can't get along with each other both turn on Paul. And it says in verse 18, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, babbler, by the way, is not a nice phrase. It comes from the image of a bird that picks up a seed and drops a seed and picks up a seed and drops a seed. It's, it's the image that was used for gossipers and people who were peddlers of second-class religious opinions. In other words, hacks. Not that smart. Stupid. So this is insulting. It reflects pride and vanity and superiority of the Athen way of life. And why is there such a response? Well, because he was preaching about the resurrection. Now, I've talked about this so many times, but I'm going to slow down and do this again because the internet is full of garbage on the resurrection and lots of people hack what was said 2,000 years ago. And it's just not true. The only people that believed in physical resurrection of people religiously were Jewish people 2,000 years ago. But they had all been taught it would happen at the end of time. It would happen to everyone at once. Out of the whole world and every religious system, they're the only ones talking about this. That's when Jesus physically rose from the dead. The disciples did not believe the women, not because they didn't believe in resurrection, but it violated the idea when it was supposed to happen. It wasn't the what, it was the when. Pagans, non-Jewish people, did not believe in resurrection at all. Greek and Roman thinking and myth is not full of all these resurrection ideas and beliefs. And again, I've quoted this many times, in the massive study on pagan thinking and physical resurrection, N.T. Wright's book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, summar summarizes it like this. Christianity was born into a world where its central claim was known to be false. Many believed the dead were non-existent, and outside of the Jewish faith, nobody believed in resurrection. Oh yes, Jew, Jew, uh, non-Jewish people, Romans and Greeks and others, maybe believed in Hades or bliss, but there was no coming back. And actually, they didn't want to come back. For the golden age of Greek and Roman thinking, which lasted about a thousand years, most of them believed the physical side of us was bad or a prison or temporary. The good thing about humanity is our spirit. So death is liberation. So why would you want physical resurrection in the first place? Simply stated, the hundreds of thousands or millions that lived in the Roman Empire and beyond did not teach, did not believe, did not desire, did not hope for physical resurrection at all. That's why Paul was called a second-class hack. What a stupid idea. Well, things escalate because Paul is still quite smart and 
quite engaging. So Paul is invited or demanded to go to the center of philosophy and pagan uh, religion of his day. He goes to a place called Mars Hill, and you can still see it today. I've been there. So when you're in Athens and you're at, at the Pantheon, you look across and there's this smaller, almost balding looking hill. And um, it's really interesting, right across the Necropolis. So it reads like this in verse 19. Then they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Ar Arogapos, where they said to him, may we know this new teaching that you're presenting. What you're bringing, you're, you're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. And then Luke throws in this thing, all the Athenians and foreigners who, foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing about talking about and listening about the latest ideas. Basically, it's like Twitter and X uh, back then, just blah, 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 all the time. So Paul is now taken to this actually very famous, venerable institution, this court. Now, he's not there standing trial in some legal sense. And, and, and not only that, uh, he's not there to see if he can get a teaching license, because actually back then, uh, this court had to give you the, the right to teach philosophy or religion. Uh, the people living here, uh, we living in 2024, probably need to ask, well, why was he taken there then? And historians and scholars tell us uh, uh, these people were famous for incorporating all sorts of new ideas and gods into their thinking. They weren't opposed to that. They were a huge melting pot. On the other hand, they were famous for also checking out every new god and every new philosophy because the most important thing to the Athenians was the morals of the state. So the issue that they're checking out is, is this a good or bad thing for morality? And verse 20 summarizes the best. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears. Okay, let me just do this again, because again, if you go to Chapters or Barnes & Noble, there's all these books that say all this stuff. It's just not true. What's the response from the religious leaders and philosophers of the day? Do they respond, oh, yes, 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 resurrection. We, we all know about that. Oh, yeah, you're just using those older Egyptian and Babylonian myths and, and Zoroastrianism, and you're reinterpreting them. No, no, that's not what they said. They didn't say, oh, this is an old idea. They mocked it or said, this is new. Again, this gets to one of the biggest ideas floating out there in movies and podcasts and books. Jesus' resurrection, so many people say, is just a religious story that everyone held sort of 2,000 years ago, was hijacked by Christians and was used. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Now, at this moment, because this is new, Paul begins his classic two-step dance with pagans. He's going to start talking about how there's only one God, and idolatry and demons isn't worth it. And then he's going to say, you can only know that God through Jesus. So in the most venerable place of philosophy, the best university department in the world, this is what he says. He says, men of Athens, verse 22, I see in every way that you're very religious. Okay, just stop. This is brilliant. He already builds a bridge. And it's the most general bridge that's out there. You're religious. He says, and I'm religious, meaning you either believe in God or gods or the supernatural or dreams or miracles or angels or something like an intelligent designer. Something's involved. And let me just remind you, probably 95% of the globe in 2024 is spiritual and religious. Even when I hang out with hardcore atheists, there's even a religious ebb to them sometimes. One of the biggest bridges we have to every neighbor we have is they're spiritual, we're spiritual, and that should be our common ground. And that's where Paul starts. And then he keeps going. He's building this case. He says in verse 23, I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship is something unknown. I'm actually going to proclaim to you. He moves from this general thing to this more specific thing, this unknown God found in their culture. And Paul declares to this group, I actually know this unknown God. Now, again, you might be confused. Why in the world did the uh, the Athenians build an altar to an unknown god. And the answer is actually classic. You find this all sorts of, in all sorts of ways in ancient thinking. You find this also in multiple cultures today that worship many gods. The people want to appease all the gods. And they had an unknown god altar because they didn't know who all the gods were. And so they didn't want to miss a blessing or make an angry god angry they did not know about. So in other words, they're, they're hedging their bets. This is religious fire insurance. 
motivated, of course, by fear and the unknown. So Paul comes along and says, well, we're all spiritual and religious. And actually, I saw this thing and let you know, I want to let you know, I actually know this unknown God and you can know him personally and you don't need to add to anything or look. He's actually come and he's a lot closer than you think. And everyone went, oh. And then he says this, classic Judaism. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. Oh, what a statement in the middle of Athens. Paul gives a response to idols. God is the creator of all things. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, which is, again, a critical Jewish name for God. He's the supreme Lord of creation. He's worthy of our allegiance. He literally is looking across the landscape of Athens filled with hundreds or thousands of shrines and temples. And Paul says with gentle boldness, literally looking at the Parthenon, um, hold on, everyone. We can't make God in in, in our image. We can't control God. And by the way, these altars and temples, they don't really contain him. You know that, right? He's actually not served by human hands. Oh, verse 25 as if God needs anything, because he himself gives all people life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of people, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and God determines the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. If you're not catching this, this is growing in offense by the second. Oh, there's only one God. Oh, and he's sovereign and he's in charge, and he makes humanity. Oh, and he doesn't need our offerings, and he provides all things, and he's the sustainer of all life. And oh, oh, actually, all of humanity started with one person, that's Adam, and God used Adam to build humanity, and God plants the nations, and we think we're in control, or we think fate moves the universe, or or something like random evolutionistic chance, or the gods are in charge. No, 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 no. God's in charge. The unknown God, he's in charge. And actually, he's really involved. God did not did this so people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. He says the divine thumbprint is in the created order, but don't confuse the divine thumbprint with himself. The DNA of human existence is marked by God. Uh, We cannot know everything about God, but we can know there's definitely a creator and he's a God of order and he's an artist and he's moral from the fine tuning and order of the universe to every single culture on earth, having this shared untaught, untaught moral code to all of our desires to worship something or someone beyond ourselves. God's invisible quality are clearly shown. Observation says yes. Moral insight says yes. Order says yes. Spiritual intuition says yes. And yet, and yet, this would be a totally fruitless enterprise unless, of course, God is way closer than we think and he's not fickle like Zeus or all the other ones. So he built, notice it, bridge one, general, bridge two, specific, uh, bridge three, then he says, oh, even your own people talk about this. And he quotes their sacred writings. Very famous verse, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now, those two quotes are actually from pagan philosophy. He, he takes from their philosophers, from their poets. The, the first one is Epitomenes of Crete, in him we move and have our being. The, the second one is from uh, uh, Aratas, we are his offspring. Now, both of them, interestingly, are used in hymns to Zeus. And Paul is saying, oh, no, 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 Um, you've got the inkling of it, but Zeus is not even who you think he is. Actually, he's false and evil. There's a greater God, and those two things are true about him. I love Michael Green, who used to uh, lead a church in Oxford, uh, who wrote this about this moment. He said, you know, it'd be easy at this point to suppose that Paul had given way too much into pagan thought, but far from it. He, He is ready to challenge their deeply held prejudices. And then, listen to this, lean in. The Athenians prided themselves on being indigenous. This is our city. We're originally from here. And therefore, we're superior, better than all others. Paul maintains that all people spring from one source, Adam. And God is the one who allots each nation their territory. This would have been incredibly insulting and painful to to the Athenians. 
And as we've seen, the Epicureans were materialists. The Stoics believed in cosmic reason as sort of a god, but not really God. And Paul asserts boldly that both to both groups, God exists, he's personal, we're made in his image, and that's why idolatry and also what you believe as Stoics and Epicureans is just wrong. Oh, he's just like throwing at grenades left and right, and he's doing it in such a winsome way. Then he says, therefore, since we are all God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, uh, an image made by man's design or skill. Idolatry is useless and wrong and unnecessary. And he says it in the heart of idolatry. He, he's rejected pantheism. We are God or God's part of everything. Nope, he's separate. And he's also rejecting Epicureanism. God's not involved. Oh, yes, he is. Of course he is. And he is through Jesus. Verse 30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now God commands all people everywhere to repent of everything you all believe, he's saying. For God has said a day where he will judge the world with justice. By the man he is appointed, he has given proof of this to all people by raising Jesus from the dead. So in the heart of the 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 best place of philosophy and the best place of idolatry, he says, repent. We are not God. We are, and God is not our inventions. We have to turn from false notions about God and see God through the person and message of Jesus alone. Do you see this? He says, all of humanity will be dealt with by Jesus. No other religious leaders, not by good works, not by family, not by business, not by religious affiliation, not by philosophy, not by government, not by good morals. Jesus. Jesus. He says this like in the house of Socrates. What? <laughs> in the place of Plato. What? Verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. And at that, Paul left the council. And a few men became followers of Paul and they believed. Some sneered and others believed, just like the beginning of the book of Acts, when Peter preached the very first Christian uh, message in a Jewish context, many sneered, lots said you're just drunk, lots of people mocked, and other people came to life itself. And by the way, it's always going to be this way. Okay, so we're here in 2024. Uh, I um, am part of Sanctus in the great city of the east side of Toronto. And I love our city. And I talk about this all the time. I mean, Athens is Toronto, right? I mean, deeply post-Christian, and yet post-modern, and yet military scientifically modern, and multicultural, and radically globalized, and fully mobile, and deeply personal. Our neighbors are atheists, and they're agnostics, and they're New Age, and they're spiritual, and they're not religious, and most of our neighbors also either have history maybe with another faith, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Baha'i, uh, Jewish, right? A and then there's all sorts of people who have Christian memory, and they're Christian but not really Christian anymore. Everyone's here. You've got all the big universities, profound economic philosophy, like, it's all here. And then, of course, there's the great idols of money and sexual uh, expressions and rights and power. I mean, anything even good can replace God. So um, Paul looking around and seeing a bunch of idols in Athens is just like walking down Young Street here. So, okay, what does Acts 17 actually instruct us, teach us, command us, invite us into as Christians living in this incredible city? And maybe you're listening from New York or, or London or Singapore or Hong Kong. Or again, you might be in a very small rural town. You're listening to this. I can't relate to that. But you can because you're online. That's where, that is the agora today. It is the virtual agora. Okay, here's the first thing we see with Paul. He was sad. Like he was broken. I, I've preached this before. It's not just a nice thought. It, it actually has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in us because it's not natural. When was the last time you looked across Toronto and you went, oh God, have mercy. We're so lost without you. Like really broken. In, until Christians actually see the lostness of people, there'll never be impetus to evangelize or, or, or love. <laughs> 
it's, it's something maybe I'll just stop here and just say like, if you're nothing else and you're a Christian, I know some of you aren't, but if you're a Christian, I'm going to ask you again, would you pray this week, God, break my heart for the city because I'm cold, I'm distracted, I don't care, I like my Christian bubble, whatever it is, just say, make me distressed. He'll answer the prayer, by the way. Here's the second thing. Have confidence, please. Our message has real power because it's rooted in God himself. It's not an idea. It's not a thought. It's not a passing fade. It's not human-centric. It's not dead spirituality. It's not hanging out with some fickle gods. And by the way, it's not just another philosophical moralism. It's a living person who's done real things and has conquered sin, death, and the demonic. Again, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It has the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes, first Jews, then non-Jews. I love when one person said about Athens, what good news Paul had for Epicurean and Stoics, living as they did under impersonal charge or fate. Behind or within reality stands neither of these, but rather a gracious, personal, creator, ruler, sustainer of all. For modern scientific humanity, living as it does with an impersonal universe that evolved by chance from a big bang to the last whimper of a dark, frigid night without starfire, Paul's message is good news. And also for postmodern humanity, this gracious personal God breaks the bonds of karma and you get what you deserve and I hope it works. What we have is really the best news ever. It's more beautiful than atheism. It resolves agnosticism. It's more loving than any religious system. And actually, at the center is Jesus. And you can't get better than him and his work. Have confidence. Have confidence. Have confidence. Here's the third thing. In in these social media-driven, divided times where everyone is in a camp and everyone's an enemy, I just want to remind you There are bridges everywhere if you want to see them. And it takes a lot to cross them, but they're there. Bridge one, general. Everyone wonders about nature and origin and meaning of life and spirituality. Is there purpose in life? Like, every person you hang out with asks that question. We have massive bridges to begin conversations with just there. Here's a specific one. Almost every person you meet either believes in God or is spiritual. Almost everyone. Every Muslim you meet believes in one God like we do. They even believe Jesus existed like we do. Now they're wrong. He's not just a prophet. But the point is, do you see how much of a bridge there is there? One God, believe in Jesus? Most faiths believe in morality. All sorts of nominal Christians around us who have church memory still wear a cross or maybe own a Bible or grandma used to pray. Like, there is so many bridges but we burn them before we even get there. Here's the other thing. I am so thankful that Paul quoted pagan philosophy. Do you know how many themes and thoughts and conversation starters there are on TV shows and podcasts and movies that easily become a bridge to talk about faith with people? In other words, what I just want to say to you is, number one, ask the Holy Spirit to make you broken, make me broken, because if we're not broken, we just won't care. Number two, have confidence in the gospel. If Paul could stand up in the middle of the epicenter of philosophy and religious thinking and declare the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, then we can too. Three, ask the Holy Spirit to start showing you where the bridges are. Start asking him, where is the bridge with that enemy, that friend, that coworker? You'll be stunned. How many, they're just everywhere. We just don't want to cross them. And here's the last thing. We talk a lot about this. I'm going to just say it again. We as Christians cannot fortress and maintain this fortress Christian bubble. We can't. You know, I'm stunned in the book of Acts how multiple people come to faith. Lots of people are loved into the kingdom by good works and they experience Jesus. Other people are thought into the kingdom by evangelism, proclamation. Other people are literally powered into the kingdom, deliverances and miracles. Whether it's love gifts, word gifts, or deed gi- uh, word gifts, or power gifts, they all have to still end up meeting Jesus as Savior and Lord and there has to be repentance. But don't underestimate the power, not only of our gospel, but the power of living a just simple Christian life in a confused, philosophically divided world. Michael Green 
said this, the link between holy living and effective evangelism could hardly be more effectively outlined than in Acts and then after. In particular, Christians stood out for chastity, they hate, they, their hatred of cruelty, their civil obedience to the government, their good citizenship. They would not expose infants. They would not swear. They refused to have, uh, have to do anything with idolatry and its byproducts. Such lives made a great impact. Even heathen pagan opponents admitted as much. Rodney Stark, who uh, wrote this unbelievable book, Dominion, another one, The Rise of Christianity, simply records the, the willingness of Christianity to care for others was put on public display in the Greco-Roman times. Pagans tried to avoid all contact with afflicted during outbreaks, often casting still the living into gutters. Christians, on the other hand, would nurse the sick, go into the gutters, and even die when they were trying to help. Christians were visible and valuable during all the frequent natural and social disasters affecting the Roman world. Even in healthier times, the pagan emperor Julian noted that followers of Jesus supported not only their own poor, but ours as well. Let me just read these snippets of scripture to you. Matthew 5, 16, let everyone see your good deeds. Luke 6, 31, love your enemies and do good to those that harm you. Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than receive. Romans 12, overcome evil with good. Galatians 6, do good to all people, not just Christians. Let me say that again. Let everyone see your good deeds. Love your enemies. Do good to them. It is more blessed to give than receive. Overcome evil with good. Do good to all people. Paul demonstrates in Athens this unbelievable willingness to weep, to be bold, to find common ground and bridges, not so he ends there, but to proclaim the, bold, the boldly the resurrection of Jesus. And then also surrounding him in Athens and beyond is just this unbelievable ongoing countercultural love towards everybody. Easily preached. Interesting, interesting historical lesson, John. Sure. But maybe we could now ask the same Holy Spirit that filled Paul to actually make us more like this. And so again, no matter what site you're at, uh, no matter uh, where you're listening to this in the world, maybe we could pray this. God, Father and Son, send the Holy Spirit. And actually, I pray for the gift of brokenness that would cut through distraction, politics, jadedness, dist and just boredom. I pray that there would be a confidence in our church to proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to atheists, agnostics, Muslims, Hindus, Baha'i, Sikhs, the list goes on. Materialists, just do it winsomely but truthfully. Lord, I pray that across our church, in general ways, specific ways, in cultural ways, you would begin to start highlighting to people, that's a conversation starter, that theme right there, that experience, that story, and you would begin to highlight in people's minds actual bridges that they could begin to cross and begin to say, by the way, you know, we share this in common, but can I tell you the whole story? Like, Holy Spirit, would you do this? And lastly, I pray that actually our church, me included, would do more good deeds. We would love our enemies. We'd actually believe and do this. It's more blessed to give than receive that we as Christians would overcome evil with good and we would be kind and good to all people, whether we agree with them or not. Holy Spirit, make us meek. Make us meek. And in that meekness, make us profoundly powerful. Help us to do well in our Athens today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.